Welcome, Ben Mama. In recent years, we've seen the resurrection of so many consoles from our youth. Firstly, in the form of plug-and-play devices like the Atari Flashback and NES Mini, which feature a limited amount of built-in games alongside authentic controllers and a reduced but accurate form factor. And then secondly, we got even more accurate versions of old systems that also had many modern mod cons, like HDMI output and updatable firmware, such as the C64 and even more notably, the Atari 2600+. It was looking at the shelves in my office, which are full of such devices, that got me thinking about console comebacks, and it struck me that this wasn't actually a new thing, as there are actually some very notable examples of previously discontinued consoles that were brought back to market within recent memory of their commercial life, and I thought it would be interesting to explore these further. So that's exactly what we're going to be looking at here, consoles that were surprisingly brought back to market by other companies after recently being killed off by their original manufacturer. I'll be looking at the reasons why these relaunches came about, what impact that had on the console's legacy, and whether the decision actually worked out. And with that explanation of what's to come out the way, it's time to get on with the show, as I proudly present five surprising console comebacks. Playing on ColecoVision in 1984, War Games, the blockbuster movie, becomes more than just a game on ColecoVision. Tarzan, the original swinger, is still the king of the jungle on ColecoVision. Frontline, the ultimate invasion on a constantly changing battlefield on ColecoVision. Congo Bongo, the hilarious jungle adventure on ColecoVision. Star Trek, fight aliens at the speed of light on ColecoVision. The best game in town keeps getting better. I always come back. Although Coleco arrived quite late to the scene in the second generation, not launching their console until the summer of 1982, some five years after the market-leading Atari 2600 and three years after the Mattel Intellivision, they quickly established themselves in the market, selling two lean consoles in just over a year. But despite gaining a nice foothold in the industry, the ColecoVision's popularity didn't stop it from becoming one of the many victims of the infamous North American video game crash. This caused sales of the console to drop off a cliff as we entered 1984, and although Coleco tried to struggle on for one more year, mostly because of their release of the failed Adam Computer, which was ColecoVision compatible of course, they pulled out the industry completely in 1985, leaving their many diehard fans feeling disappointed. We all thought that was the end of the ColecoVision, especially when the new, much more powerful consoles like the Atari 7800 and Nintendo Entertainment System started to arrive on the scene in the mid-80s. But to everyone's surprise, the console would actually make quite a short-lived comeback, as in 1986, just a year after the ColecoVision had been officially discontinued, a Taiwanese company called Bit Corporation, who at the time were best known for their range of bootleg Atari 2600 games, created a clone of the console called the Dina 2-in-1. Originally engineered as an illegal copy of the ColecoVision for Asian markets, it was also able to play games from the hardware similar Sega SG-1002, hence the 2-in-1 part of the name. Due to both consoles being based on the very similar MSX-like technology, BitCorp were able to include two cartridge slots and a switchable BIOS that would change depending on what slot was being used. Over in the West, mail order game specialist Telegames had taken note. They had previously been an official distributor of the ColecoVision in Europe and North America, and once Coleco stopped production, they wanted to continue selling the system and its games to their large base of consumers. So they actually acquired the rights to the console from Coleco, so they could officially distribute the Dina 2-in-1 as the Telegames personal arcade in the West, promoting it as a fully ColecoVision compatible system. This console also included an exclusive built-in game called Meteoric Shower, which would later be released for the ColecoVision separately. Telegames would also rebrand and re-release all the games that BitCorp had developed for the Dina 2-in-1, such as Strike It, Tank Wars and Cosmic Crisis. But that's not all. As Telegames also picked up the rights to several previously unreleased ColecoVision games like Activision's Rock and Bolt and Alcazar, as well as developing a game of their own in skiing. Although it only stayed on the market for a few years, with Telegames eventually selling through all their stock, mostly to people who needed replacement systems, according to company founder Pete Mortimer, 
The Teeny Toon one did greatly extend the life of a system that many people thought was already dead, and this rather unique console variation has now become extremely rare and sought after by hardcore ColecoVision collectors. I always come back. I mentioned it briefly in the last entry, so it makes sense that I cover this one next, because the Mattel Intellivision is another second generation console that makes a comeback in the mid 80s, and a lot of people seem to be surprised when they discover this, so let's find out just how that came about. Like Coleco as mentioned, and so many others like Magnavox and Astrocade, Mattel were also a high profile victim of the much talked about North American video game crash. To paint the picture of just how bad things were, in late 1983 Mattel Electronics announced losses of over 280 million and the writing was on the wall. Their parent company first slashed the price of the new redesigned Intellivision 2 to just $69, cut 660 staff and then announced that Mattel Electronics would only be a software company going forward. With this, all development of new hardware was cancelled including the already previewed Intellivision 3 and a hugely powerful Intellivision 4, which I've covered in detail in a previous video, which I'll link down in the description. As they began to sustain further losses while they watched the North American console market almost completely collapse, in February 1984, Mattel made the choice to close the electronics division down entirely and laid off the rest of the staff. With this decision, they also announced that the Intellivision had been officially discontinued and all remaining consoles and games were subsequently liquidated. Many thought the Intellivision had a pretty good run, staying on the market for five years from 1979 to 1984, and the end was somewhat expected. People were certainly a lot less shocked to see the Intellivision go than the ColecoVision. But inside Mattel Electronics, there were people who thought that the end was somewhat premature, and there was still life in the old dog yet. This included former Senior Vice President of Marketing, Terence Valeski who understood that although the losses were huge, the demand for video games had actually increased in 1983, partly due to the rise of inexpensive home computers like the Atari XL and Commodore 64. Valeski soon sought out investors to help him purchase the rights to Intellivision, the games and the remaining inventory from Mattel. Just over six months after the console had been officially discontinued, Valeski and friends formed a new company named INTV Corporation, who would initially sell the console and games via mail order, but also hoped to get it back into retail stores too. As well as selling through existing inventory, including reprints of many games that were no longer available, often removing associated licenses to avoid paying royalties, most notably the many Intellivision sports games, INTV Corp would also acquire the rights to many unreleased prototypes, such as Hover Force, Thundercastle and Dig Dug, as well as commissioning new games of their own, like Commando, Diner and Stadium Mud Buggies, which was the very last official Intellivision game released in 1989. This wasn't all though, they also created their own cost reduced version of the console called the Intellivision System 3. Not to be confused with the unreleased and much more powerful Intellivision 3, which I already mentioned. In fact, by 1987 things were going so well for the new company that they announced they would revive the previously cancelled Intellivision 3 and finally bring it back to market. Presumably they would have needed to give it a name change in wake of their own new hardware revision, but they never actually cleared this naming confusion up. Sadly, these plans were very short-lived as by 1988, the Nintendo juggernaut was in full flow and stores wanted to give as much space to this system as possible, while also supporting other new consoles by Sega and Atari. This left INTV with nowhere to go and they returned to selling the Intellivision via mail order and through selected Radio Shack stores. The Intellivision range was finally discontinued in 1990, some 11 years after the console's launch when INTV Corporation signed up to be a third party developer for the Nintendo Entertainment System. This was part of the condition of their license, which really shows the kind of stranglehold Nintendo had on the North American video game market at this time. Unfortunately this move into publishing was very short lived, and shortly after the release of Monster Truck Rally for the NES in 1991, INTV Corporation filed for bankruptcy. Of course, this wouldn't be the end of the brand completely, as it was revived once again in 1997 when former Blue Sky Ranger Keith Robinson formed a new company called Intellivision Productions and purchased all the assets via TV Corporation. 
At first, this was just a venture to preserve the history of the company, but as the interest in retro gaming grew, and television production started producing compilations of their old games for modern systems, and even published several unreleased in television games, such as Illusions and Super Pro Pool and Billiards. Sadly, on the 15th of June 2017, Mr. In Television himself, Keith Robinson, passed away, and for a while the future of the brand was in limbo. However, in May 2018, it was announced that the company had been purchased by award-winning video game musician Tommy Tallarico, who had a long-standing fondness for the console. He renamed the company in Television Entertainment, and then announced that they would be producing a new console of their own, named the Amico, meaning that the Intellivision was finally going to get that follow-up that had been promised so many times before. But despite a lot of initial excitement, this project soon turned sour, a story I simply don't have the time or inclination to cover here, which eventually led to Atari purchasing all rights to the brand and its IP earlier this year, finally putting an end to the first great console war. I always come back. And from a couple of consoles from former industry leaders to a handheld from another as we move to the next generation and turn our heads towards the Sega Game Gear. Released in Japan at the end of 1990 with a western release for the following year, the Game Gear was greeted by a lot of fanfare, and with Sega leading the console market in both North America and Europe at this time, the handheld was expected to compete very favourably with the existing Nintendo Game Boy and Atari Lynx. Sadly, things never quite went as well as Sega hoped for a number of reasons, but mostly due to the Game Gear's terrible battery life and poor build quality. And to that it was far from a failure, with sales over 10 million units, it paled in comparison to the Game Boy's success, which topped close to 120 million. When it came to support, its decent install base was helped by having nearly identical hardware to the already existing Sega Master System console and this saw over 350 games released for the Game Gear before it was finally discontinued in 1997, where it was being sold alongside Sega's new 32-bit Saturn, a console two generations more advanced, making it look very primitive in comparison. It was effectively replaced by the Sega Nomad, a handheld Sega Genesis, released two years previous, but that also suffered from many of the same issues. Now given that last point in particular, you'd think the Game Gear was long forgotten by the turn of the century, but not so, as for some reason well-known video game distributor Majesco Entertainment chose to follow their own lead, having already introduced the budget price Genesis 3 to North America, by picking up the rights to produce their own version of the Sega Game Gear 2. But whereas the launch of the Genesis 3 took place when the 16-bit Sega was still very much a commercially supported system with new games still being released, the Game Gear was very much dead in the water in the year 2000, making it seem like a very bizarre decision indeed. Majesco would sell their version of the Game Gear for just $30, equivalent to around $50 in today's money, making it somewhat of a bargain, especially when you consider that the games themselves were retailing for just $15 as well as republishing many existing games, particularly ones that would appeal to young children such as the various Disney properties, Majesco also published a brand new game in the form of Super Battle Tank, and promised many more would follow. Though sadly this never happened, as reception to the new repackaged Game Gear was less than stellar, as most people were happy to save up the extra to buy Game Boy Color or the new Game Boy Advance that arrived just a year later. Majesco's redesigned and cost-reduced hardware also suffered from similar add-on compatibility problems to their Genesis 3 design, not being compatible with either the TV tuner or Mars System converter. And with this lack of success, Majesco chose to discontinue their version of the Game Gear in early 2002, and end their relationship with Sega, who were having struggles of their own that also saw them leave the home console market around the same time. This left massive piles of unsold inventory, so much so in fact that you can still go online and buy sealed Majesco Game Gear games very cheaply in the present day. I always come back. Okay, so the next entry isn't actually a console, it's a home computer, but it's one that was very much designed with games in mind, and indeed it was mostly used for that very thing especially as the Amiga 1200 was accompanied by a console using the same hardware in the form of the Amiga CD32. But while the latter wasn't relaunched after Commodore went bust, the former was, so it's well worth covering here. 
I'd better start this one by explaining the background for those who don't know how Commodore's demise came about. And for that we need to rewind to May 1994 when Commodore International announced they were entering voluntary bankruptcy having just posted an $8.2 million loss for the previous quarter. Initially this only affected the parent company as Commodore's subsidiaries in Canada, Germany, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom were still very profitable and continued to trade, initially selling through existing stock and then adding things like peripherals to their range in order to diversify and make a bit more cash. Both Commodore BV and Commodore UK were interested in making bids to acquire the parent company, but only the latter managed to secure enough funds to go ahead. However, they pulled out when they learned that huge PC manufacturers Dell and Escom were interested in purchasing the company, knowing they would not be able to compete. On the 22nd of April 1995, it was announced that the successful bidder was German PC manufacturer Escom, who beat Dell's bid by $6.6 million. Commodore UK then went into liquidation themselves on August 30th, 1995. Shortly after acquiring all rights to the Amiga computer, Escom relaunched the A1200 at a new price of $399.99, returning it to the market around a year after it disappeared, hoping there were still enough Amiga fans around to make it viable. However, it was the price more than the relaunch that raised the most eyebrows, as it was £150 more expensive than the previous model, sold by Commodore UK bringing widespread criticism from users and the press alike, with accusations of price gouging and profiteering. They drew even more criticism, but people learned that these new models came equipped with a modified high-density PC disk drive, which caused many compatibility problems with a host of existing software. SCOM did offer a service where you could have this problem fixed, or fit the extra parts yourself, but it was too little too late, and they never managed to revive the Amiga's fortunes, and never launched any of the proposed new models either. Indeed, Escom themselves also went bankrupt on the 15th of July 1996 after announcing losses of 185 million German marks that year. The Commodore trademarks were purchased the following year by Tulip Computers, whilst the remaining trademarks together with a full set of patents, copyrights and other intellectual property were acquired by Gateway 2000. From here we enter a really confusing timeline of events that saw both the Commodore and Amiga names and IP sold on, separated and even fought over by different companies who still believe they owned the sole rights. But it would take me far too long to go into all of that here and I still have another console to cover. I always come back. I really don't think I need to go into the failure of the Atari Jaguar here or what led to its demise. It's been covered on YouTube ad infinitum and indeed on my own channel in the past too. So I'll link a couple of videos specific to that subject in the description for those interested. What I do want to concentrate on here though is the brief return of the Atari Jaguar, an incredibly unlikely situation if you ever heard one, given the epic commercial failure of the 64-bit beast that saw it only sell 125,000 units before Atari started liquidating stock. As you no doubt know, the Jaguar was officially discontinued in February 1996, with the last Atari published game being Virtua Fighter clone Fight for Life and shortly after the game's release, it was announced that Atari Corporation would be merging with hard drive manufacturers JT Storage. Now this move baffled a lot of people, with many people expecting Atari to make the move into publishing games for other people's systems, especially after releasing several PC games including Tempest 2000 and Flip Out on the new Atari Interactive label. However, it soon became clear that the poor health of both Jack Trammell and his son Sam had played a big part in this decision. Jack had already been forced to take back the reins of the company after his son's heart attack having previously given him control, and this had contributed massively as Jack was ready to retire and Sam wasn't ready to return. JT Storage needed cash to bring products to market and Atari had it, as they had recently received a $90 million investment from rival Sega due to the infringement of numerous hardware patents by the Japanese giant. The merger meant that the Trammels could take a back seat as major shareholders and a small division of Atari would remain purely for the licensing of their legacy IP to other people. But though this deal effectively killed off the Jaguar, we did see one final flurry of games thanks to stalwart third party publishers Telegames. As part of the terms of the JTS merger, Atari had to make an agreement with its shareholders to support both the Jaguar and Lynx for another year. 
So rather than publish the games through JTS, they signed a deal with Telegames to do it for them. Atari handed over a number of finished but unreleased games on both CD and cartridge to them, including Iron Soldier 2, World Tour Racing 05, Towers 2 and Breakout 2000. Ironically, these actually turned out to be some of the Jaguar's best games, the kind of titles it sorely needed back in 1994. Telegames then made a promise that they would continue to support the Jaguar going forward by picking up and releasing other unreleased games for the system. But sales were nowhere near as good as they hoped, and Team 17's Worms, which was originally due to be published by Ocean Software, marked the last official release for the Jaguar in 1998. But Telegames weren't just involved in releasing new games for the system because they also purchased all of Atari's remaining inventory, clearing out not only their Sunnyvale warehouse, but also Atari UK's vast stockpile, which already included all the stock from other Atari offices across Europe. Telegames itself was already split into two parts, Telegames USA in Lancaster, Texas, and the parent company in the UK found in Wigston, Leicestershire. So this worked out well for them, with them being able to take in Atari's inventory from both sides of the pond without much hassle. Telegames had long supported so-called orphaned consoles and had previously done deals with people like Coleco, the European partner CBS Electronics and Mattel. Of course, we already talked about Telegames earlier in this video with their resurrection of the ColecoVision. But in an interview I did with Telegames founder Pete Mortimer, who still runs the company to this day, back in 2014, he revealed that even he was shocked with the amount of inventory Atari delivered when just three days after the deal was signed, no less than five articulated lorries arrived at their UK warehouse, all loaded to the top with product. For reference, they only expected one. And he went on to tell me that it took them 36 hours of non-stop unloading to get it all into their warehouse. And remember, this was just the UK, as Telegames USA also took in vast quantities of stock too. With over 100,000 consoles in stock and even more games, Telegames had to find a way to shift some of this inventory as it was taking up a lot of room and hindering their everyday activities. But it took them five years to find a solution. And in 2001, when the idea of so-called retro gaming was just starting to become a thing, Telegames struck a deal with leading UK games retailer Game to sell the Jaguar and its games in all stores. The console would retail for just £30, with games starting at £10 for older titles like Doom and Tempest 2000, with newer Telegames branded releases as well as later games that were only produced in small numbers retailing for £40. Aside from its presence on the packaging, Atari branding wasn't used anywhere, with the Telegames name and logo being prominent. This was just after Hasbro had sold the Atari AP to Infogrames, having previously released all rights to the Jaguar into the public domain two years before. The Telegames and game relationship continued until 2007, by which time some games were being sold for just £1. If only for a time machine, eh? I must warn you about Jaguar, a new video game system too powerful for home use. Unlike Nintendo and Sega with only 16 bits of power, Jaguar by Atari gives you 64 bits of mega power. Clear the room and I'll be back for adults only. Are we alone? Look! Jaguar by Atari is the only video game system with 64 bits of awesome power! This irresponsible action! Oh, I'm not into the living room for my young people! And that rounds up my look at the five consoles that made rather unlikely and surprising comebacks. Which of these returns most surprised you? Or did you purchase one of these consoles during its revival period? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comments section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons and YouTube backers for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following people in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Paul Daniel, Minns, Dos Gamer Man, Luke MC, Carl Olson, Seth Robinson, Frosty, Mark Strickland, Kalimatorn, Trogdor the Burninator, Daniel Skronsky, Ben P. Stein, Tabby Kitsune, David Maddox, Your Eyes Are Bleeding, Joe Kassara, Classic Gamer 74, Bernard Santu, Peter Grantham, Noah Man, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now, where you can get access to hosted content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.